Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you are, and welcome to the Sustainable Infrastructure Webinar Series, focusing on Principle 1 uh, of the UNEP 10 Principles on uh, Sustainable Infrastructure, which is called Strategic Planning. I am Anna Grou from the French research program ITECOP on infrastructure, landscape, and ecosystem, and I'll present you the logistic of today's conference. Uh, we remind you that the session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded. Uh, you will have the opportunity to unmute yourself during the breakout session. Uh, we are offering a certificate of attendance for those who uh, answered the post survey uh, session. And don't hesitate to use the chat function on Zoom for question or technical assistance because Claire and Sarah are here to help you. And a link to the session uh, recording will be emailed to you and available on our website. This meeting will be interactive and we are using a separate tool for polling today called Mentimeter. And I would like everybody to practice by answering our first two questions right now. So please go to the Mentimeter link in your chat box right now and answer these two questions uh, about your profession and from uh, where you come from. So it should be uh, looking like this. And while you're doing this, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Elizabeth Lossos. She's a senior fellow at Duke University's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solution, where she runs a program on sustainable infrastructure. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna, and uh, good morning afternoon and evening to everyone. We are delighted to have you all back. Um, hopefully many of you joined us for our last our session last month, but if not, feel free to go to our website and find the recording. We will uh, be meeting every month for the next year. Uh, and the objective of this series, just briefly, is to uh, exchange knowledge on how to plan and build sustainable infrastructure. To participate in this interactive forum, we are using a model from Project ECHO, which you heard about last time, as a way of uh, bringing practitioners and specialists together using case studies. And finally, building, connecting with others in this community to build a community of practice. And to do this, can I have the next slide? We will be doing this, as Anna said, using uh, UNEP's uh, good practices. And in the chat box, we are going to go ahead and put that link to the UNEP report that has these 10 practices. But each month, we're going to take a look at uh, one of them, including, of course, today, we are going to look at strategic planning. Now, the format of today's session, 75 minute session will be the same as uh, we'll be using for the next 10 months. And that is, we are gonna have a brief introduction of the principle today's strategic planning. And we will then have a technical presentation by a subject matter expert, Aren Kohlhoff. And he's gonna tell us about one very important uh, tool used for strategic planning. And then we're going to have two case study uh, examples, one from Pakistan and one from the Gambia. Throughout the event, we're going to be doing a series of polling. And at the, after the case studies, we will be having a breakout session where we're, we're really going to encourage all of you to um, bring your experiences. In this case, if you've been involved at all with strategic planning or just broadly in this area, to a discussion of these case studies. This is the first of 10. We are um, still trying out this method. If you have advice, please do fill out the survey at the end or feel free to send us an email with advice on how we can do this better in the future. We are um, ultimately looking to build a knowledge hub 
all this information will be put on the website afterwards of the recording, but also case studies and write-ups. Uh, and we're really hoping to um, continue to build this. So this is a work in progress. Um, please join us again throughout and bring um, your colleagues and friends as well in the future. So with that, we are gonna start with an introduction from uh, Rowan Palmer from UNEP, who is gonna tell us about the first principle, which is strategic planning. Rowan is the program management officer in uh, UNEP's resources and market branch in Geneva, and he leads UNEP's strategic infrastructure partnership. So Rowan, over to you. Thanks very much, Liz. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and you should be able to see my slide. Tell me if you can't see it, but uh, as Liz mentioned, we're, these webinars are organized around the, the 10 international good practice principles for sustainable infrastructure. And today we're looking at strategic planning. Um, as you can see from this diagram of, of the infrastructure life cycle, uh, we consider strategic planning to be a standalone phase uh, in the life cycle. And in fact, the first phase, it is the, the earliest possible time that we should be thinking about incorporating sustainability into decision making and also therefore the most important because uh, the benefits of doing this will flow downstream in the life cycle. Uh, so this principle states that infrastructure development decisions should be based on strategic planning that is aligned with global sustainable development agendas uh, and here the, the SDGs and the 2030 agenda is the obvious one. Um, and be supported by enabling policies, regulations, and institutions that facilitate coordination across departments and both national and subnational levels of government and public administration. And so if we, if we break the principle down, there are really three main components. Uh, the first is, is the need for a long-term vision because the infrastructure that we build now is going to last for decades. So it's important that it's planned in a way that accounts for long-term service needs, for long-term risks to service delivery, uh, for long-term uh, social, environmental, and economic impacts, both positive and negative. So the, the impacts and the benefits. Um, and it's also important that infrastructure planning can transcend short-term political cycles where the incentives are not always aligned with long-term objectives. Um, and for this kind of planning, the SDGs do provide uh, a good framework uh, to address all three aspects of sustainability, the environmental, social, and economic in an integrated way. And they also provide uh, targets and indicators to help align strategic planning with the desired outcomes. The second component of this principle is institutional coordination, both vertical coordination between different levels of government and, and horizontal across different sectors of different ministries and different stakeholder groups. Um, this is important for making sure that strategic planning is properly aligned with, with different development needs in different sectors and that national and local policies and, and objectives are well aligned. Um, You're muted. Thanks. Um, it's also important to help facilitate uh, broad ownership of, of strategic plans across different parts of government and civil society, uh, because implementing them requires the cooperation of many different actors. And then finally, <clears throat> the third part of the principle is about the enabling environment for strategic planning. So policies and, and regulations need to incentivize sustainability and, and be aligned with strategic object objectives, and they need to be stable and predictable enough to create a, a good business and investment environment. And then you need institutions to be set up in a way that facilitates these types of integrated coordinated approaches. Um, and, and ultimately, it's the enabling environment that plays a, a big role in determining whether a strategic infrastructure plan can be put into action. And there are lots of different tools out there that can be used for strategic planning. 
Um, we were a partner in a database of tools for, for strategic planning, but also all, all other phases of the infrastructure lifecycle. And you can check out this database on the Sustainable Infrastructure Tool Navigator website. And I think uh, the link should be in the chat. Um, but in the webinar today, we're going to learn a bit more about two of these strategic planning tools. The first, Strategic Environmental Assessment, is a really effective tool for incorporating environmental, social, and economic considerations into strategic infrastructure planning in an integrated way uh, and for facilitating um, the institutional coordination that's needed to have a, an effective plan. And we're going to see uh, a presentation on the technical details of strategic environmental assessment and then also a case study of its application in Pakistan. And then we're going to see a case study on the application of UNOPS's CAT I tool, which is used to assess the enabling environment for sustainable infrastructure and identify capacity needs and actions uh, to address them. And we're going to learn in next month's webinar, we'll learn more about the technical details of how the CAT I tool works. Uh, but the case study today is going to focus on how it was used to help build capacity for developing and implementing a strategic infrastructure plan in the Gambia. Um, so that's what we have coming up. Uh, before we get to the presentations, I'm just going to th hand things to my colleague, Emily, to go over uh, the results from the Mentimeter. Emily Corwin is a water resources engineer and the director of nature-based engineering solutions at Conservation International, where she works with partners to create the science, solutions, and field examples needed to bring an innovative green gray infrastructure approach to the world's vulnerable communities. Emily. Great. Thank you so much, Rowan. And thanks, Liz, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, so we, as Rowan mentioned, we're using Mentimeter. I'm going to paste the link um, again in the chat here. And the first two questions are really wanting to learn more about who you are and where you're coming from. So the first one here, um, what one word would you use to describe your profession? Um, we have 55 folks who've entered so far, and it looks like engineers, students, and conservationists are coming to the top. So please um, go ahead and enter there, and we'll look forward to seeing how this evolves. And the next one is, where are you in the world? Great, so it looks like we've got a lot of folks joining us from the US, Geneva, France, Germany, Colombia, welcome. So please um, go ahead and move on to the second poll questions. And those are gonna focus on um, your involvement with strategic planning and experience. And that will um, be a nice segue into our technical presenter. Uh, and Arend, if you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen. Arend Kohlhoff is a senior advisor and trainer on environmental impact assessments and strategic environmental assessment capacity development for the International Department of the Netherlands Commission for Environmental Assessment. He worked in about 20 countries. He's established the Climate Change Section at the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA, of which he's the chair. So thank you so much, Arend. It's an, an honor to have you here with us today. Uh, my name is Arend Bolhoff. I'm working for the Netherlands Commission for Environmental Assessment a government uh, funded and based organization in the Netherlands. And for now almost 30 years working in the field of impact assessment, primarily in low and middle income countries. Um, next slide, please. In this presentation, I am going to answer the following four questions. What is strategic environmental assessment? Uh, why strategic environmental assessment? What are the benefits of SEA, as the abbreviation is called, and how to do SEA, of course, all in a nutshell. Next, please. 
So what is SEA? The internationally agreed definition of SEA is it's a tool to support and improve strategic planning and decision making. SEA complements strategic planning by integrating environmental issues, evaluates their interlinkages with economic and social issues, and facilitating a public and governmental dialogue on these issues. Next, please. Um, if we link uh, SEA towards the infrastructure life cycle presented by Roman Palmer, as well as the green arrow presented at the first seminar, uh, reflecting on the policy and project cycle, you see that SEA supports the first phase of the policy cycle, strategic planning and prioritization. Next, please. The take home message uh, is SEA is considered to be the legal tool to integrate environmental issues in governmental planning. Next, please. Next, please. Yes, and here I make a comparison with a tool known as environmental impact assessment. I assume that most of you are familiar with that tool as it's legally uh, binding in all countries in the world, and typically where EIA is supporting the preparation uh, of projects, SEA is supporting the development of government plans, policies, or programs. So you definitely see that there is a sequence in uh, applying those tools, why, where SEA is typically an upstream tool and EIA is more a downstream tool. Next slide, please. This is an example of a project requiring an EAA, a hydropower project in Laos. This is typically the type of projects they require everywhere in the world, an EAA based on national legislation. Next. This is an example of a recently finished SEA, a voluntary SEA, because Myanmar has no SEA legislation yet, where SEA has supported the development of a hydropower development plan. Um, an inventory was made of all plans, the red triangles, hydropower projects in the country, and an amazing number of 50 large hydropower projects have been identified. Oh, so the question was raising, what would happen? What would be the environmental, social, and biodiversity impacts if all those projects would be conducted? And that is typically a question that can be answered by SEA, and that provides you with very valuable information for decision making. Next. The most important outcome of this SEA report was the map you will see on the right side, and it has three colors. The red um, illustrates a very high value from environmental biodiversity, as well as from social perspective. And the low, on the other hand, a relatively low value. So this map now is used by the approval authorities in Myanmar to decide whether a hydropower project will be approved or not. And then typically the red areas are not suitable or not so suitable for hydropower projects, while the orange areas, uh, hydropower might be conducted but under very stringent conditions, and in the yellow area, you can more easily develop hydropower projects. Next, please. This is also a picture to illustrate that the process steps for EAA and SEA are rather familiar, screening, scoping, public participation, assessment, reviewing, decision-making and monitoring. But next, the differences between, next please. The differences between EAA and SEA are shown, for example, for public participation. In EAA for projects in general, the public is consulted and informed to respond to an EAA, whilst in an SEA, for example, in Myanmar, nearly all inhabitants of the country are some way affected. So then it's not possible to involve all individuals and typically uh, representative bodies are asked to uh, respond on behalf of their user groups or interest groups. Next, please. Another difference is data information and analysis. In EAAs, typically, 
primary data is collected, uh, more quantitative analysis are done, whilst in SEA, use is made of available data because often there is no time at, for example, a national scale to gather additional data, and therefore more use is made of qualitative methods. Next, please. Next, please. Yes. Here you see how SEA is legally spreading around the globe in the last decades. Uh, in orange, you see all the countries that have in 2019 adopted SEA as a legal tool. And as far as we know, that is about 108 countries presently. Um, and another 30 countries have partially adopted SEA. And then you see the other countries, the yellow countries, um, they are uh, in the process of developing guidance or they are voluntary uh, applying uh, SEAs. And then there are a number of gray countries where uh, there is no SEA legislation yet, nor SEA practice. So we expect that in 10 to 20 years, all, all countries in the world have legally adopted SEA as a planning tool. Next, please. So then the question, of course, is why SEA? Well, uh, that is a rather simple answer to maintain the environmental resource base for development of our planet and our societies. On the next slide, please, that is very well illustrated by the hierarchy of 17 sustainable development goals, very well illustrated by the Stockholm Resilience Institute. And here you see that um, the four so-called green or biosphere SDGs, number 14, 15, 6 and 13 are considered to be the resource base for the other SDGs. And it is now acknowledged that, I mean, you should take care very well of those four so-called green SDGs to be able to achieve the SDGs at the society and economy level. And typically what SEA can do can mainstream the environmental issues in the sector plans responsible of the ministries trying to achieve the SDGs at society and economy level. Next, please. So what are the benefits of SEA? Well, the most important benefits of SEA are first of all, it prevents the development of unsustainable projects because this early planning phase tries to take out those projects which are not sustainable. Second, a very important benefit is it supports, as I just illustrated, the sustainable development goals through identifying more sustainable alternatives, resulting in, amongst others, more green jobs and more green investments. It strengthens accountable decision-making through stakeholder involvement and transparency of the processes. And based on that, it can build on commitment and trust, and as a result, it avoids conflicts. So there are definitely a lot of benefits. Next, please. And that is very well um, also stated by the CEO of Shell, one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world, who stated two years ago during an interview, by the way, it's a Dutch lady who is leading this large company, I support strategic environment assessment because it helps us in working at the most acceptable locations. A good strategic environment assessment saves us time and money as well, although that is probably less important for a large oil and gas company. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. Um, how to do SEA? Well, effective SEA complements planning with three core, um, well, I would say components. First, a solid assessment of environmental and, if relevant, uh, other issues. Secondly, a well-structured government debate on these issues. Uh, and thirdly, a mechanism to take the results of the assessment as well as the debate into account. And that is secured ideally through a legal procedure. And if a country has no SEA legislation yet, the legal procedure can specifically be designed for the execution of an SEA process. Next, please. Um, next, please. This picture shows you that we are very much aware that we are dealing with a high-level decision-making when you were talking about SEA supporting 
policy making, making plan at national levels, at country, uh, in countries. And that means that many different stakeholders try to get an interest and try to get, um, try to achieve their objectives. So that means that you are dealing with a policy arena, which I would consider as it's all about power. And if it's all about power, you need to be very clear about the rules of the game. So not only the formal rules of the, go the game, but also you should get a clarity about the informal rules of the game. Because in practice, of course, you often see that the informal rules of the game have more influence on the ultimate results and the policy or plan than the formal uh, rules of the game. So this illustrates that, um, yeah, this is how policy making works in practice, although it can be structured as I just tried, as I just tried to explain. You. Next, please. So this is an overview based on about 25 years of experience of most of the plans that have been subject to SEA worldwide. You see a distinction on the uh, y-axis between national level, regional level, which is sub-national level and local level. And on the uh, x-axis sector, multi-sector or all sectors involved. For example, uh, left upper, you see that a national energy plan, which is the responsibility of the Minister of Energy, is in a growing number of countries subject to SEA. Uh, on the other hand, if we go to all sectors, right bottom, a local plan, an urban development plan, typically uh, all uh, stakeholders and all sectors are involved in urban development plan. And also those type of development plans for cities can benefit from SEA. So here you have an overview of, I would say, the majority of plans over the last decades that can benefit or have benefited from SEA in many countries. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, yes, that is what I would like to share with you. Great, thank you so much, Erin. That was um, a great overview and that is definitely my favorite slide so far uh, in our series on <laughs> the, the process of developing an SEA. So, and I really appreciate the kind of distinction and description between an environmental impact assessment on a project basis and the value add that a strategic environmental assessment can provide beforehand. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again and uh, for those of you who are just joining us, we are using um, the Mentimeter software tool to collect your input throughout um, the, our time together. And so I want to share with you the results from our second set of polls. Uh, let's see here. Um, so the first question is, have you personally participated in any strategic planning process related to infrastructure planning? And it looks like we have 68 folks, about half of you have um, responded so far. And the majority no, but a good number of you have. So great to have your experience um, with us today. And for those of you who haven't, um, to be learning alongside us. And then how many strategic environmental assessments have you been involved with? And it looks like of 71 respondents, the average is about 0.5, so less than one. Um, so those of you who have maybe haven't done too many. Um, so if you can go ahead and move on to the, the next poll, um, which will kind of bring forward what are the benefits of strategic environmental assessments? Looks like some of you already have moved on, so that's great. Um, and there are numerous, I think, is the take home message from this one. Um, so with that, I am going to introduce our first case study um, that is going to be shared with us from David Annandale. And David is an international environmental policy consultant who's focused on strategic environmental planning, environmental impact assessments, and environmental safeguard procedures. He has 30 years of experience in assignments for the ADB, World Bank, UNDP, UNEP, IUCN, and DANITA. And for 13 years, he was a tenured academic at Murdoch University in Australia, ending as Dean of the School of Environmental Science. 
In Pakistan, he is the international consultant on two strategic environmental pilot projects managed by IUCN. One is an assessment of the impacts of the hydropower plan in Azad Jammu in Kashmir, and a strategic environmental assessment of the proposed Gilgit City Master Plan. So with that, David, I'm looking forward to hearing about your work, and I'll pass it to you. Thank you, uh, Emily, for that introduction. I'm going to uh, share my screen now as well. So let me just find uh, the presentation I'm looking for, which is this one. Um, and uh, so, yes, uh, Emily's given a, a, a nice introduction there. Um, the case I'm going to talk to you about, uh, it's uh, uh, very uh, short, uh, it won't take long. Uh, it was a very interesting case. It was now, I should say that it was now uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I think, no, seven years ago that we did this work. Um, and Aaron's uh, organization, the Netherlands National Commission for Environmental Assessment were the technical advisors on this work. It was funded by the Embassy of the Netherlands managed uh, on the ground by IUCN Pakistan. Uh, they had a, <clears throat> a big involvement in uh, managing the development of SEA in Pakistan at that time, writing regulations, doing case studies, doing capacity building. And this, this project I'm going to introduce you to was uh, run by myself and a local uh, Pakistan consulting company called Hagler Bailey Pakistan. So let me... Uh, walk you through the um, case, if I can, no, yes, there we go, <laughs> sorry. All right, now, uh, so just some background then. Um, the situation in Pakistan at that stage uh, was a significant power outages. Um, causing major political turmoil at that time. I mean, re really significant uh, power outages. If you, if you were working in Pakistan at that time, around 2013, 2014, you would, you would have your power going out every 20 minutes. You'd be sitting in a meeting and it, everything would go dark every 20 minutes or so, and then it would flick back on again. This was causing really significant uh, political problems. This part of uh, um, Pakistan I'm going to introduce you to in a minute in a map as a Jammu Kashmir is in the western Himalaya, uh, mountainous, uh, 9,000 megawatts of available electricity supply. Um, the situation faced by, uh, by uh, energy planners was a 60 odd hydropower projects in a, quite a small part of uh, the, the northwest of Pakistan. Um, very fragile area, fragile politically, uh, because it's in that area of dispute between India and Pakistan, but also from a, uh, an environmental and physical point of view, susceptible to terrible earthquakes, floods, um, also at the same time, a very significant area of biodiversity um, in the part of the Himalaya where the Hindu Kush, the Himalaya um, meet uh, in, in one, one spot. Um, so that we had in that, in that area, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, uh, a number of hydro projects already in place, but uh, literally around 60 projects in various stages of development at four different levels of proponent. Uh, public sector, national public sector, um, regional public sector, uh, and different levels of private proponent, each with their, with their own plans, not integrated, separate, basically separate, four separate levels of planning. Um, so I'm sorry, let me try and, this is not moving for me. Why aren't you behaving yourself? <laughs> Let me, I'm trying to move to the next slide. There we are, okay. Uh, so this is a, a map of um, Pakistan. Obviously the area that we're, we were, we're looking at, we're talking about today is just this little 
stretch in here. This is Azad Jammu Kashmir. It has an interesting um, constitutional situation, if you like. It's not, not really formally part of Pakistan, but it's administered by Pakistan. And it's in this area, obviously, of, of conflict with, with uh, India. This is the Indian side of the what's called the line of control, which is just here. So we're looking at 60 odd projects planned for this small part of Northwest Pakistan. So we came into this situation then with, with these, these 60 odd projects, different levels of um, uh, proponent. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, and so we, we, were, we were asked by the provincial government of Azad Jammu Kashmir to the, the embassy of, of the Netherlands uh, and the National Commission on uh, Netherlands Commission on Environmental Assessment, IUCN, were asked by the provincial government to look at the issue of hydropower planning in Azad Jammu Kashmir, how to, how to make it work a bit better. So um, this, this work uh, took place over the course of, of a year. Uh, Elizabeth, if you can let's walk through a, a bit more, right, keep going. I'll just put this all together. Uh, keep going, keep going, keep going, and just stop there, thanks. So three phases of this work um, done with, with a, a lot of stakeholder input, um, initial early work on scoping the problem, looking at was there actually a hydropower plane in Azad Jammu Kashmir or not? The answer, no, there wasn't. There was not an over, overarching plan, but there were four separate plans from different levels of, of proponents. So how to, how to look at that problem then was the next step. So then what we did was we, we built some, some, some scenarios looking at um, the implications of Dif different levels of development in that in that province in the second phase from June to November, um, looking at what would what, what would happen with uh, at different levels of development, looking at the environmental and social sensitivity of rivers and streams in that area. So we mapped all of the rivers, all of the streams, put the um, proposed hydro projects on top of those rivers and streams that what we knew about the environmental and social sensitivity of those rivers and streams. Then we were able to come up with a, um, suggestions for how those projects might be optimized um, and then how um, institutions might be reformed. So if we could go to the next slide, Elizabeth. So, we have two, two maps here um, that I'll, I'll show you. This is, the, this is the area that we're looking at. Um, you can see the line of control, uh, red dotted line here that, that um, um, delineates the, the Indian from the Pakistan side. Um, we've got all of the proposed, 60 proposed uh, hydro projects on that map and through a Com complicated and detailed um, piece of, uh, of uh, primary research were able to show um, which dams were and which stream segments were likely to be more sensitive uh, than others. So here we're showing, for example, that the Poonch River Valley, which is the, the, the area with the red um, shading, was, was probably the most sensitive from an ecological point of view. If we could look at the next next slide as well, and this is the same map, obviously, but looking at um, socioeconomic conditions. So we, we have the two maps here: one looking at biophysical possible biophysical implications of the development of these dams, and this one looking at social implications. As you can see, again, it shows this this area um, in in with the red shading of rivers as being the most sensitive from a social point of view as well. So what this did was enable us to show decision makers in, in literally in a series of, of, of maps where the most sensitive rivers were and hence where they might think of 
um, investing time and, and energy and thought as to how to schedule the building of dams. If we go to the next slide. So um, this is a case that I've sometimes spent half a day talking about, showing, showing people how the methodology worked, how we came to um, the, the conclusions about sensitivity of different river stretches. I haven't been able to do that with you today. But, but here's, here's the, the sort of takeaway um, final slide about, about challenges. Um, from a technical point of view, there was no high, provincial hydropower plan in place when we started this work. And, and so we had these four levels of proponent doing different things without much contact between, between them. The project managed to, um, to, to bring those proponents together and design a, a provincial hydropower plan. That was one of the positive outcomes that I'll show you, I think, on the next slide, one final slide. Um, challenges. Well, it was, it was virtually impossible to undertake proper public consultation in this case because, because it's a conflict-ridden area. Um, I don't need to tell you, you know, what's going on in that part of the world. It's not a not a safe place to go out and do do consultation. So that that was a problem, um, and and we overcame that in part because the Pakistan consulting company that I was working with to do this had done a lot of previous consultation on other dams in the region, in in the times when conflict was not so so uh, problematic. So that helped a lot. And we knew a lot about the biophysical baseline and social baseline conditions of the rivers in that relatively small province. Other challenges, who controls access to water? The most of the water actually flows through from India. So, you know, uh, to what extent does Pakistan or as a Jammu Kashmir actually have control over, over water? Um, and then another very significant challenge was how to not scare off investors. Some of the bigger dams that were on that map already had Korean and international foreign investors lined up to build, build projects. The, the government that we were, agencies that we were working with were really scared that if we showed these maps and talked about sensitivities, that that would scare off some of the, the, the investors. Um, so that was a very, that was a significant challenge. Um, and then, then the final um, economic challenge, if you like, was, well, is it worth it? Um, it we, this was an SEO focused on looking at the cumulative, possible cumulative impacts of just hydropower projects. But of course, there are other energy choices in Pakistan that could have been less problematic. Um, uh, coal-fired power plants in the Tar Desert in, in southeastern Pakistan may well have been a better energy choice than, than, than damming rivers in a, in, a, in a very sensitive part of, of, of the Himalaya. Um, so this is a case where SEO looked just at, at one energy sector, but not at the broad set of possible energy choices that, that could be um, before before us. I think we've got one more slide, Liz, if we could. Yeah, so super quickly then. Um, there were some really significant output comes from this work, I think. One was putting together these four different um, levels of proponent and coming up with an actual unified uh, hydropower plan for, for the province. Um, it, it applied a really rigorous methodology um, to assessing the cumulative impacts of the projects I have, that I haven't been able to show you today that's been used in other hydropower cases since. And again, and the final lesson is how important it is when you're dealing with busy, uh, distractible decision makers, how important si simple maps can be if it's possible to work at that level. We found that this was an extremely important way of getting information across um, simply without them having to read you know hundreds of pages of, of documentation so that's it i think thank you for listening thank you david that is fascinating and clearly a um a very volatile part of the world that uh you all have done some really tremendous work uh, we are, because we have um, a lot we're trying to do and we're still trying to 
work out the format to get everything in. Um, we have, I'm sure people have thoughts about this project and Arendt's uh, presentation as well. We're gonna have one more case study and then we're going to have breakout sessions where a lot of these issues that might be on the top of your mind can be discussed. So we're gonna move right now to Talia Rengo Escribano, who is um, our final presenter of the day. She is an architect and urban planner who's studied in international development cooperation studies. She has more than 14 years of experience working in Spain, Bolivia, Costa Rica, Morocco, Mozambique, Germany, and currently the Gambia, mostly supporting local governments, urban develop, urban uh, departments. So she is right now uh, working with UNOPS in the Gambia, holding the position of capacity building team leader at the Sustainable Urban Development Program, Greater Banjul 2020 to 2040. And we're gonna hear much more about that. Thank you, Talia. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, let me share my screen now. And while Talia is sharing her screen, as, as Liz mentioned, feel free to write any questions um, or respond to questions in the chat um, to, for David or Arendt. Could you please confirm you can see my screen? Very well. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. As Elizabeth was saying, I am based in the Gambia, which is a very small country in, in West Africa. And I, I am working for UNOPS, the, the UN Office for Project Services in this Sustainable Urban Development Program, Greater Banjul 2020-2040 project, which uh, we call Greater Banjul 2040 because it's a, such a long name. Uh, it's a project funded by the African Development Bank and uh, the main beneficiary or the main partner of the project is the government of the Gambia. Uh, we are directly working with the Ministry of Lands and Regional Government at the national level, as well as the Port Authority. And uh, we work with three uh, government, uh, local governments in the metropolitan area uh, around Banjul, which is the capital of the country. So today I want to present the application of the capacity assessment tool for infrastructure, which is a, um, a UNOX tool. So we have applied this tool in the context, in the context of this project. And um, uh, let me just give you a bit of context uh, background so that you can understand what we are doing here. Um, the Greater Banjul 2040 project is an urban planning project. So we are trying to develop uh, an urban plan for to, to, to support the government in developing, uh, yeah, developing the, the, um, the Greater Banjul area in the next 20 years. So the main output of the project is this urban plan but also a five-year investment plan for the three councils that are involved in the project and uh, a list of priority projects that hopefully will be implemented in the next 20 years. So even if it's an urban planning project, it has a very strong component on capacity building. So we wanted to make sure that the institutions that will deal with a new set of data that we'll, we will hand over to them uh, have the technical capacity to deal with this data, that they will understand uh, what we have been doing. They are involved in the development of the products and that they will manage to, to update the urban plan in due time um, when we are not here. So that's why we applied the CACAI tool to identify the capacity gaps in the, uh, in the government. Uh, in terms of planning, delivery, and management of infrastructure so that we could really draft a targeted technical assistance action plan that would accompany the development of the project uh, products. So I am not going to, to speak a lot about the, the, the tool itself because in the next webinar, you will have a dedicated session on this. So if uh, you are interested, I, I would encourage you to attend the next webinar so that you can know more about the tool. But basically, I just wanted to show you how it looks like. It's an online tool that was developed by UNOPS. And uh, so it um, goes through the three 
main stages of infrastructure, so planning, delivery, and management. Then the tool establishes uh, 11 sub-indicators, among which uh, strategic planning is one of them. And for each sub-indicator, you have like an, a high number of questions, yes and no questions that you have to respond. So in total, it's like around 900 questions. So when we applied this tool in the Gambia, of course, we conducted some desk review. We, we uh, checked like the available regulation policies um, plans. And um, also we conducted several interviews with the main stakeholders, agencies that are involved in the infrastructure uh, in the country. And um, what we wanted to obtain was like a list of challenges or um, we wanted to know where we should focus our technical assistance to really understand what we um, were facing and where we should uh, enhance our active um, support to make sure that the government can deal with, with uh, as I said, the urban plan and the project products in the end. So uh, the, the list of the findings that the CATI tool gave us uh, or allowed us to identify is much longer than this. I, I just wanted to show you like some of the, of the issues that are related to strategic planning that we um, obtained from the from the tool and um, so in terms of strategic planning interestingly enough in the country as in the Gambia even if it's a developing country and very small it receives quite a lot of support of international uh, donors and organizations so it um, the country has a national development plan and uh, at the national level. And it also has the three councils that we are working with. They have the strategic municipal plans, uh, municipal strategic plans, sorry. So they, they have these tools. Um, they have been drafted with the support of UNDP, but in practice, they are not implemented because there's limited capacity of technical staff to do so. So this was one of the challenges that the CATA tool um, highlighted and that it's important for us to know because we are developing an urban plan, which is also a strategic plan. So we have to know that this may be an issue in the future as well. Uh, in terms of uh, governance, governance and political challenges, what we saw is that, uh, well, it was mentioned several times during the assessment that the lack of a land policy at the national level that guides spatial planning is an issue. Also, um, the fact that the current land use for the greater Venezuela area has not been updated for the last 20 years while it is compulsory to do so every five years and uh, I mean we knew that because that's the reason why we are implementing this project so to among other things update the current land use plan and to say what uh, could be built and where and uh, in which um, uh, so in which condition and um, so that was also one of the challenges that was highlighted and um, very important, the lack of coordination and data sharing between institutions, so both horizontally and uh, multi-level. Um, this, is, this is an issue that we have, I mean, we have experienced ourselves as well. And in terms of um, financial challenges, so as I said, even if these strategic plans exist, um, what the capacity assessment tool revealed is that the there is not uh, enough resources to implement those plans. So this was something that um, we should take into consideration as, as well. So once we had this long list, which is much longer, as I said, uh, we shared these findings with the stakeholders and we, um, we prioritized uh, some of them. So as I said, this, this, the purpose of the application of this tool was to draft a targeted technical assistance action plan. So according to the interests of our main stakeholders and the scope of the project, we decided to focus on only some of them because of course, the, the, I didn't mention this, but the project is only two years. And um, so we couldn't address everything. So we decided to target the technical assistance on, on um, increasing the capacity of technical staff uh, in dealing with the strategic plans, 
also uh, trying to foster the coordination among different institutions and uh, trying to find mechanisms, not to find mechanisms, but to support the local governments, particularly in setting up some mechanisms so that they could increase the revenue collection and make sure that at some point they will manage to implement the projects that will be identified uh, through, the, through the whole process. So that's how we, we managed to define this technical assistance action plan. So from this list, uh, this priority pri prioritized list of items or challenges, uh, looking for some um, activities or approaches that could solve the root causes of these challenges. And just to give you an example, so what we um, identified is that sometimes uh, these, these strategic plans are, are formulated even with stakeholders involvement and participation, but sometimes even the technical staff that is involved in the process don't understand very well uh, what like kind uh, this, this basic sustainable urban planning principles. So sometimes it's really um, necessary to unpack these concepts to provide practical examples of what we mean when we are talking about sustainable land use or sustainable uh, transportation. So this is what we are trying to do through, through the, um, the activities that we are proposing in the project. Um, also to address this lack of coordination, what we have been doing um, for the past months is to, of course, at the beginning of the project, we put all the stakeholders together and we organized some uh, visioning workshops to make sure that uh, there is a, an agreed vision for the future of Greater Banjul. But also after this vision in workshop, we have been organizing different focus groups with different institutions on, on, on different topics to, to draft these development scenarios and on that basis to draft the future land use um, plan. Uh, at the same time, to, to address the lack of resources for in the strategic uh, plan implementation, um, as I was saying, just to give you a very practical example, we are training the staff at the council on the application of uh, on the use of geographic information systems applied to property tax collection so that uh, in the future they will manage to increase the revenue collection and uh, invest in uh, infrastructure projects. So um, maybe um, just some of the lessons that, that we are still learning because uh, as I said, this is an ongoing process, but uh, looking at what the CATA tool revealed from other strategic plans and uh, the experience that we have from the last months working in the project um, is maybe that, uh, I mean, this may seem obvious, but I think it's important to have it in mind that the strategic plans are a, a, a valuable starting point, but it is not enough because it does not warranty that the, they are currently implemented. And um, also, I think that the fact of unpacking the concepts that we um, include in these strategic plans is important to work on the imagery of uh, people that will need to implement these plans at some point. Uh, what I think that is important, and I, I think it's proving useful along the process is to um, adopt this learn by doing approach. So to really bring the institutions and uh, involve them as much as possible in taking decisions on how, um, I mean, just in the, in the case of the land use plan, they are really um, hands-on and they are proposing how they um, will, they, they imagine the, the future urban plan will look like. So uh, I think that involving them and uh, explaining to them what the, we mean by all these topics that we are addressing increases the ownership and uh, probably the sustainability of the plan at least that's the, the, the hope we have and um, also another takeaway i think it's important to mention is that um, it's important to to involve not only the governments and the implementing agencies that need to be part of the process but also citizens and civil society organizations this is something we have been doing um, to, to make the government accountable at some point to guarantee that the projects, the strategic plans are um, implemented. So one of the questions and the risk that we know that we may have 
because we have seen that this has happened with the, the national development plan and the strategic uh, municipal plans is how to how to guarantee that the, the stakeholders or the citizens and civil society organizations will um, remember that uh, these plans need to be implemented once we are not here or once they are adopted. So um, yeah, stakeholders involvement to enhance accountability, I think that it's also important. And um, yeah, I think that's it from my side. I have the feeling that I have rushed a lot, but I was really concerned about the time. So thank you very much. I will be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Over, thank you. Uh, thank you, Talia. That was that was great. We don't have time for questions, although if people want to put questions in the chat for Talia or uh, contact her or David or Ren, we will make sure they get the questions. What we're going to do in this last phase is um, go into breakout groups and one of the presenters or both organizers will be hosting each. And what we'd like each of you all to do is um, look, at, try and discuss these two questions in light of both the two case studies we've just heard about, but also if you have your own personal experience working on a strategic planning process somewhere, we would very much like you to bring that uh, to the front. We're interested, just to give you some examples of what you might be thinking about, what are the enabling conditions like Rowan talked about at the top, of uh, this discussion or capacities required for effective strategic planning. Um, you see here three possibilities, or the second is once you have a strategic plan, how do you actually get it implemented, which is obviously critical in both of the two plans we've just heard about. So we're gonna break into groups of roughly 15. We have just about 12 minutes at the end of the 12 minutes, we're going to ask you to put your comments to these, your personal comments, any thoughts you have, back into the Mentimeter because we're collecting your, um, everybody's input on these. We also have a survey, which we're going to post in the chat here now, a post-session survey that we very much would hope that everyone will fill out. and. Um, if you fill out the survey, you will receive a certificate of attendance for today's meeting, which will be emailed to you. So let's go ahead and break out now, and we will send you a message when you should start thinking about putting your answers into the Mentimeter in the post survey. Welcome back, everyone. That was short but sweet, and I already can feel that in the next ones, we'll leave more time for the breakout room conversations because I think they're so rich and a great word, way to learn from each other. Um, so I'm sharing my screen, and one of the things we wanted to do was encourage you to put in your observations from the breakout room into the Mentimeter so we could capture some of the thoughts and be able to share that back with you all after this session. Um, so just for time, I won't go into these. Maybe I'll read a couple. Um, so enabling conditions around public participation, policy support, um, good communication. And I know in our group, we talked a lot about using a multi-stakeholder approach. And then maybe, I don't wanna say most importantly, but moving these plans to action um, and how to do that. So thinking about enforcement, policy, coordination and data sharing, um, finances. I know one of the things that we talked about was the importance of having consistent leadership, um, be that in the government or possibly from the finance sector. So thank you all so much for contributing to the Mentimeter poll. And I think Liz is gonna um, have a final uh, close and farewell for us. Oh, you're on mute. Thought I had unmuted myself. Thank you all so much. Please come back um, next month. Um, Emily, do you just want to show next month's screen? You can already uh, register for next month. We will put that in the chat. We also will leave open the uh, Mentimeter for a little while. So please do put in your comments 
especially on those the breakout and um, importantly the um, there is a post session survey and we really like your input on that so that we can learn how to um, make these sessions better in the future. We here we go. Here is the next webinar, and as Talia said, we are going to dig more deeply into some of the tools used, not just for strategic planning, but that next stage of prioritization of projects and programs, et cetera, trying to look at responsive, resilient, and flexible uh, service provision. So please join us in July. We are taking August off vacations, uh, but have um, the principles planned out through next April.